everybody. Well, I will now hand over to Shakar, who is a very senior member of our Human Centre Test Team. Shakar has been with the surety over eight years now, um, coming to us from South Africa, and has worked in both our Wellington and Auckland offices. Um, Shakar is very experienced in the space around ERP transformations and zero transformations, and has worked actually really closely with one of our panelists, Tony, in terms of the two degrees transformation there. So you're a very experienced hand with this lovely panel, but I'll hand over to you, Shakar, as the moderator, and uh, maybe she'll introduce our guests. Awesome, thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our event today. So, as we all know, ERP transformations are fraught with challenges. Um, let's face it, we've all heard those horror stories of ERP transformations or large uh, software um, uh, implementations, uh, software projects going wrong, and none of us enjoy being in those sorts of projects. So that's the reason why we're here today, is to listen to and learn from our two very experienced and esteemed panelists today, Tony Warren and Andrew McPherson. Um, who between them have decades of experience in implementing... Make it sound old! Many, many years. A decade between us. Some years of, of implementing uh, <laughs> large-scale ERP transformations. Um, so we want to find out what works, and more importantly, what doesn't work, so we can steer away from that. So we've prepared a few questions to kick off the panel discussion today. Um, some of these questions will center around uh, some uh, test project management activities like managing a budget uh, through a test program or uh, ERP implementation and uh, post implementation for maintenance purposes as well. And also, let's not forget our favorite tech topic of the moment right now, artificial intelligence. So let's just jump straight into our discussion today. So the first question is, can you share a specific example from your experience where an ERP transformation program faced unexpected challenges or setbacks. How did you overcome those obstacles and what lessons did you learn from that experience? Sounds a bit like a job interview, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> I studied as much. Who's it? Me first? You, ladies yep. first. Oh, lovely. Um, look, um, give you a bit of background. So. I was part of, I was the test practice manager at Two Degrees and started in 2020. And um, project was already seven months into the making and um, we, we, started, um, we started testing late, or I think it was probably the next year. Either way, we started testing and during that time we had a, um, we had a lockdown, two lockdowns, we had three program managers, we had the great resignation, we had high staff turnover and lots of sickness. So there a lot of change, a lot of things happening. And in amongst it all, we had to keep it to a, somewhat to a timeline. And uh, ultimately, you know, let's do testing and development together. Um, and uh, I think we fell into that normal trap where you end up, um, we kicked off testing, we, we made some good progress, but unfortunately we found some defects as you would expect, and there was not sufficient capability within the uh, development teams to support any rework whilst they were a dev and flight. And I, and I think that's um, something that happens commonly, and um, not only not having enough cap uh, capacity to support rework and flight, but also um, not just in ARP, but also in other programs. And it's something that we need to consider when we, we do our plannings, because often it happens, more often than not, right? It's been my key learning. Andrew. Yes, so, you know, just to set some context, over the last two and a half years, I've been leading a um, large transformation at, at Stuff. So you probably know Stuff from the stuff.co.nz uh, website. Uh, but in addition to that, we also have 50 newspapers. Uh, so nine of those are daily newspapers and the rest are like weekly newspapers like the Sunday Star Times and the community newspapers. So uh, when I started at Stuff uh, two and a half years ago, the, the platform was, you know, was quite old, a lot of different systems and, and things like that. And we really had to transform you know, every, everything across that and that included how all of the ad inventory was managed you know, right through all those commercial processes. Um, and just uh, some context, I've actually just finished up at Stuff um, just over the last uh, um, week actually, I just finished last Friday. So, 
So and one of the big challenges I think we had was that um, the business was in an operational mode and had been in for many years and we didn't actually have any BAs that were sitting there kind of documenting processes or anything like that. So processes had changed um, over the years since the systems had initially been implemented uh, and we were in a state where you know, people were using the systems um, but that knowledge about you know, workflows and how systems work there was no documentation, so it was really inside everyone's heads, and it was inside those SMEs, and it wasn't a single SME. It was this, you know, people only had the knowledge that applied to their specific role. So when it came to a point of actually starting to understand you know, what we needed in terms of a set of requirements, or you know, what even should we be going out and, and looking to, to purchase, there was no one I could, I could talk to and sort of gather that. So, and the challenge in addition to that was that all of the people who I could potentially talk to um, you know, they were busy in their day jobs, so you know I couldn't sort of stop the press and say, "Hey, let's you know let's all get together in a room for a, for a week and, and put together a set of requirements or we'll document our workflows." So we're in a really difficult position there, and you know, I think a lot of businesses probably find themselves in this role now because you know businesses have leaned out, and you don't tend to keep those roles in a business like the you know, BAs are, you know, they're expensive and they and they they're often seen as extra. You know, why do you why do you need them if you're just operating day to day? Um, but then when you come to that point of change, it's uh, you know, absolutely critical. So what we had to do was uh, we actually had um, you know, external BAs come, come in and, uh, and actually work with us and our subject matter experts to kind of help draw that knowledge out. Um, and it was a combination of drawing the knowledge out of our, comp our subject matter experts as well as training some of our um, subject matter experts how to be BAs themselves. So there was this kind of two-way knowledge transfer that, that was going on so that would enable us effectively to be able to um, start by documenting our processes. And then those people were then able to move through with the project into then uh, helping us work out what the configuration would need to be on the new system, you know, test the new system, uh, you know, train you know, people on, onto new systems and things like that. So it was really that, that people side. But I just want to make one other point as well, is uh, a project, particularly when you're under a lot of delivery pressure and you've got, got a lot of new people coming in, there, there is often an over-focus on the happy path. And you know, the happy path is kind of when everything flows fine and that, that there's no errors or obstacles on the way through. And you know the challenges are not often on the happy path. It's when something goes wrong, and often those problems don't come out till much later in, in the project. And because there's been an overfocus on the on the happy path due to potentially this lack of knowledge that's inside the business, people don't know what all of the obstacles or or other kind of edge cases could be. Um, those you you discover those you know as you go through. It's a process of discovery, which means you're constantly um, having to go back and then. You know, maybe make modifications to the happy path to incorporate those things. So those are those are some of the challenges I had, but I'm certainly happy to elaborate um, later on if we yeah. need to. Sure. I mean, so the key lessons learned there is uh, business processes documented in order for the program to continue. Yeah. Well, I think the no, I think the learning is that um, you know, because there's change in a business over time, you can't expect your documentation from 10 or 15 years ago when the, the old system was implemented to be up to date. You know, mm. people people would have changed how they use the system. So I think the, the learning is I think you need to, you know, I think this is where external partners like, you know, say Surety are really important and, and getting some impact players and that can bring some structured, say, bus, you know, uh, analysis approach into the business uh, and help upskill your, your people so they can start to, you know, to, to document their knowledge but in a much more structured way. I think that's really the, the insight that I gained. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. So let's move over to, to a hot topic. and. This one's around data migration. So in the context of ERP transformation, uh, data migration is often a significant challenge. So could you provide examples or an example of how data quality practices have impacted the success of your projects? It's always a challenge. Um, you know, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'll, I'll take a slightly different, different tack on it. Uh, you know, data migration from my point of view, it's not a single thing that happens on kind of the evening of go live that you bring all the data across because now you know, we're in a situation where you're not necessarily working with a single system. You know, if you have your ERP system or your CRM system and all these other systems, there's a lot of interconnected systems together and data sitting across multiple systems. And really when you're transitioning off your old environment to your new environment, you actually end up going through a number of transitional stages, um, transition phases you, you may call them. 
And through those transition phases, you actually need to keep data consistent and effectively have multiple migrations as you go through. And as you move into those transition phases, you may do some parallel running as you, as you try to manage risk between the old, you know, your old state to your new state. And it, it means that data migration, is, as I said, is not a one-off event, it's a continuous thing because you're, you're testing and getting ready for that migration, you're running parallel, you're then migrating, you're then checking your data back and validating your new environment against the old environment, and then you're getting ready for that next transition state as you move through, as you're maybe then you know, introducing a new system into the environment and deprecating an old one. So my, my view is you actually need, or it's good to take a systematic approach. Uh, where you have some sort of platform or something that helps you migrate data. And our approach was, uh, we actually used a, a cloud-based um, integration platform, a sort of integration platform as a service. Um, I mean, look, there's lots of different ones out there you could choose, and I don't know whether we chose the best one or not, but we use something called uh, Wikato, which is basically, it is an integration platform, but what effectively it enabled us to do is very quickly integrate between Different, different things, uh, almost on a, like an ad hoc basis, and to enable data to move very quickly between different systems. And when that data was moving through this platform, there was a full audit trail, uh, and all those, all of those, um, effectively like transactions that were moving, you could go back and have a look at them at any, any point in time and see. So if you ended up in a in an unknown kind of state uh, or transition state, you you think maybe some data had got corrupted or damaged or the transformation hadn't worked pro properly, you were able to go back and look at those and potentially rerun different migrations and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I guess my, my view is that you, you have to, well, you should take a, a really systematic approach to data migration and don't think of it as a one-off sort of piece of custom code that necessarily moves data. Um, think of it maybe more as a, you know, what is your, your platform that really um, supports uh, complex integrations in a way that can enable data migration. Awesome. Uh, there's a question there, I think, around data migration, but I think Tony will maybe add to that. Yeah, definitely build on it. I absolutely agree with everything you said. But um, my key experience in data migration seems to be that we always undercook the activity. We leave it to last. It's always last to come into the environment to test against. And um, we don't do enough up front to um, have that ready and in a ready state to uh, complete our testing within, within the timelines that we're aiming for. So um, I think in addition to that, we need to make sure that we plan out that activity um, with the right resources and, the right, and understand that it's quite a complex activity that needs a, quite a lot of focus on it up front. So otherwise you just keep pushing forward pushing your time forward and, and, and not completing the times that you want to. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and I completely agree with that. I mean, I've been on projects where it gets to that last few weeks where people are getting ready for go live and it's like, oh, well, how are we migrating data? And everyone kind of looks at each other and sort of, oh, we hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And then when you actually look at the data migration, that's a six month project in itself. And it's yeah. kind of like, well, we're not going live, you know, next in, in four weeks, you know, we're going live in four months because we now need to migrate all this data and it's, you always think of migration as a simple, oh, we just take data from here to there, but so often there's some massive transformation that has to happen on, on the way through, and that's the, that's the difficult part. Yeah. yeah. So it needs to be very structured, very intentional, done early. Mm. So in, in terms of done early, how, how early would you say? Is there a specific project phase, test phase, that you would, you, you would want data migration done by? Look, I mean, these activities, they all kick off in parallel, don't they? It's just about making sure that you understand the complexity, have the right level of um, resources and um, knowledge assigned to that so that you can progress. I mean, I can speak to the own, the example that I was working with at Two Degrees. We, we had a single point of failure. We had one person who was responsible for the data strategy, the data migration strategy. It wasn't enough. It was too little, too late. We finished testing functionally before we even had a level of quality in our in our uh, data migration strategy. Mm. Yeah, I think you really, you know, you've got to be doing it right at the start and thinking, you know, at the same time you're selecting your technology and look at requirements and specifications, you've actually got to be thinking about the data migration, how are you going to migrate data? What is the you know, requirements in data migration, looking at the current, say, data schemas and structures you've got versus what would be required in that new system and, and really factor that in and hopefully be able to get that priced up and, and you know, on the timelines right at the start. Well, thank you. Okay, let's move on. Move on to another hot topic, which uh, is around customization. And in the world of ERP, 
customization is often a double-edged sword. How do you strike the balance between tailoring your ERP system to meet specific business needs and keeping the software manageable and upgradable in the long run? Martin? Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I mean, I've, I've said it before uh, to people when we've talked about this, it's about bending your business around the, um, the tool, not the tool around the business. Customization, the lowest level you can get is the better in terms of cost of ownership ongoing. Um, two degrees, we had 10%, just under 10% customization, best practice, 5%. Um, I was talking to companies that had more than 20% that were going live and actively reversing out their customization and, um, and trying to align more closely with the tool. Uh, horror story, oh, not that much of a horror story. Um, look, one that I remember quite, quite clearly is um, we, we had a very manual process for the um, approval of purchase orders. I think it was about eight layers. Now, out-of-box functionality for D365 is four, and we put a change request in to increase the um, approval layers to eight. And I'm kind of like, you know, out-of-box functionality, best practice recommendation is four. Why aren't we bent into that rather than um, putting a change request in, increasing our automation? And, and um, yeah, so we went live with that, and um, sometime later it's been uh, reversed back out. So, yeah. Yeah, so customization, yeah, I, I think the, the approach now really is to go more configuration than customization, really try to minimize the customization, as, as you said. Um, yeah, my, my view, if you start to zoom out and look at what's happening you know, across IT and products, you know, a lot of these tools are, are becoming um, commodity products now, especially with the move to, to SaaS and the cloud and things. So really, if, if you're taking the approach of trying to minimize the total cost of ownership of a, of a platform, you know, really you're trying to choose a solution that, that can implement the workflows that you need and then you're trying to really you know, minimise any change because that will minimise the total cost of ownership. The problem is when you, custom, when you customise, you know, then you need to maintain those, you know, those people with the skills that can maintain those customizations across version upgrades and, and all of that. And it's just an ongoing cost to the business. So you know, I, I totally agree with what you said. It's really about changing your business to, to fit in with the workflows that are in within that sort of commodity product that you're that you're moving to, um, rather than trying to change that product to, to fit your business. So I think most um, you know business business owners or, or you know senior leaders would would recognise that now and hopefully support that approach. Yeah. So so in your <laughs> instance, Tony, what was that reversal because of the cost of ownership <coughs> maintenance overhead? Uh, that oh, it became cumbersome? actually became quite a cumbersome process just once it went live. Um, I think I think it must have been quite a uh, well I certainly know that as a cost centre owner managing that process it was submit ring someone can you approve ring the next person can you approve who's the next person approve it I write I'll ring that person and get them to approve or flick an email or a team's message um, it was a it was a lot less transparent once uh, it became uh, automated so you didn't quite know who to ring so things took longer and uh, yeah okay well, that's good insight Okay, let's go on to a question for, for Andrew. Uh, and I know you've, you've been attending a lot of uh, meetups and conferences around artificial intelligence recently. So what specific AI tools can organizations use to enable more efficient workflows? Um, so yeah, we, we used a, a, like at stuff in this recent uh, transformation project, we used AI in a number of ways uh, throughout, so certainly in automating steps of workflow, but we go specifically to the project. Um, areas where we used it and it was really effective were in, in documentation. So we used a product called uh, Scribe How, or, or um, I think it's ScribeHow.com or uh, Scribe.how. And what it is, it's a tool that enables you to effectively, you know, you know offer, use a, a software, you know, package, whatever it is, and click through the screens and, and do what you do. And it automatically creates like a user guide off the side of showing this, capturing the screens, writing what you're doing, and our you know, learning and development uh, team or function use that to very, very quickly produce user guides. And it's, it's almost like magic when you see it working. Um, and, and there's other software that's similar that does, you know, capture the videos automatically as well. So something that would have taken, you know, weeks and weeks of work were, were done, 
you know, within within a, a days, you know, or hours, and uh, was able to be updated very rapidly as we were making changes to to the system. So I think in, in documentation, you know, using AI is, is really good. Um, you know, we we actually used AI um, it, it, across a number of things. It's it's stuff right from. You know, this new system introduced AI to automatically lay out the newspapers. So when you look at a newspaper now, where all of the article, where the articles are on the pages, is now determined by AI. So it, it, um, the stories are all written and they're, they're ranked and rated, and they're also tagged by another AI software that's actually tagging all of the the topics and entities that are mentioned within that story. That story then gets picked up by a, an AI engine, and depending on its priority, it is then laid uh, appropriately within the newspaper in a way that fits with all the advertising and it scales the images to to um, make sure that the story fills the whole page or, or multiple stories fit together, uh, either in rows or columns and things to to fill the page. It's quite it's quite incredible uh, what's able to be done. And, and before this project, that was all done manually. And when you think there's um, you know, nine daily newspapers and there's, there's 50 other uh, papers in total, uh, that there's, there was a lot going on there manually. So, you know, incredible from a productivity improvement. And it meant the team were focusing more on maybe some more artistic things on the front page, doing, doing some things like that. But the majority of the paper was laid out uh, with, with AI. Um, but I think now, when you look at the tools, um, you know, you know, whether you, you know, if you're tracking it, even ChatGPT just this week, there's, you know, it's gone multimodal, and you can use it in a way to do so many things across images and, and text. And um, yeah, but actually, one one technology that I think is probably the most productivity improving is actually the um, and there's various AI different products that can do this, but uh, recording and tr automatically transcribing meetings. So I, I think. A few years ago, we'd always have a project administrator in the in the room taking minutes mm. and and you know, summarising that down, so you had a record of of, of the um, what was discussed and what the action action items were. That can largely be automated now uh, with it, with tools that effectively connect into the meeting and actually transcribe and, and do bullet points. And we we were using that throughout the project as well. Um, you know, again, a, a, a great um, productivity enhancer, it's a time yeah. saver. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's move on. Um, to project budgeting and test budgeting. So ensuring alignment with user needs, staying within budget and adhering to timelines are essential goals in ERP transformation. So could you share any strategies for, or best practices for achieving this delicate balance, particularly when unexpected changes or user requirements emerge during the project? Plan for the worst, hope for the best. That's pretty much the strategy. Um, I think a lot of people, from a testing perspective, undercook um, defect contingency. And uh, I know that last time I went into a project, the development manager was trying to tell me it was 5%. And I was like, what? We've got a whole new front end, a new web, a new two new apps, we've got a chatbot, 5%, a new integration layer. Um, we eventually settled on 30%, which would be fairly typical for a program that size, yeah. So, um, and it's the same for an ERP program, make sure that you plan for your, um, your defect rework <coughs> and con through contingency. And, um, and, you know, you hold your timelines and you can either do that by, well, you can either do it by extending your timeline or adding more people. Um, with regards to the actual overall test budget, plus or minus 10%, you'll have all heard that. Make sure you include that. That en enables you to support any sudden re new requirements or surprises that come on the horizon or that you find out as a consequence of doing the job. And um, yeah, and, and generally you should be able to meet your target. I know that within um, our program for uh, two degrees, two, uh, we were on target. We did, yeah. We, we met our financials and that's that doesn't happen that often really, does it? So, so how often do you find yourself eating into your contingency? Uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> things happen, right? But then I, I will say, you know, it doesn't really matter how much contingency you plan if the, if the teams are wrapping around you aren't able to support you as well. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the average f days to fix defects in our last, in our migration project, Free, 54 days. Didn't matter how much contingency we put in, we're <coughs> never going to have enough, right? 
Um, there's reasons for that. Uh, whereas on the digital side, um, six days. Mm. So, um, and we had a defect rate of uh, 40%, but six day turnaround, it didn't really matter. Yeah. Andrew. Mm. Well, well, I think testing is a key you know, technique for managing risk within a, within a project because you, you know, the more you test, the, the more certain you are certain things are going to work when you, when you go live and you, you've managed you know, a certain amount of risk there. And I think this also links back to what we were talking about before in terms of customization versus configuration because the more you customize something, the, the more testing you're going to have to do because all of that customization is likely to have you've introduced bugs and you've, you, you've done things that you know are not right and you're going to have to fix them. So again, you know, my approach is or now is like let's try and stick to the base product as well, you know, as much as we can. That's mm. likely being tested by you know the company that's written it and all other users that are using that functionality. And you know, you, you need to do a certain degree of testing to make sure that that works. But once you've done that, you, you have the solid foundation. And then you can t start deciding what are the parts where we have introduced um, you know, risk through our customizations or configurations that we need to spend more, put more attention on. And, and also your data migration, you're making sure that data is right. And you know, with my most recent experience and what we've been doing, we, um, you know, we actually had a, a, a tester uh, from Assurity helping us and actually a team, so Rachel here. And, you know, we had to make some pretty tough calls kind of on the fly as it got towards towards the end. Um, yeah, you know, for example, as we were going live, our um, our integration to our billing system was still wasn't wasn't fully uh, operational at that point in time, uh, which would normally you know make anyone quite nervous. Um, and but I actually knew that our data was secure. With the testing we'd done and with that integration platform we had, we could easily make changes and we could present that data through to our billing system, you know, however which way we needed to and make, and make those changes you know, within, our, within the window of time we had before our next billing run. Uh, and it was a calculated risk, uh, calculated uh, decision based on the, you know, an assessment of the risk we had. Uh, but that was, that was only possible because of the testing we'd done. Had, had we not done any, you know, done a sufficient testing and I, I was, and if I was concerned that our base data would be corrupted or potentially or something, I, we would have had to move out our go live date. So it's, it's really, you know, I think testing is, is kind of a, an enabler really in enabling you to, to plan and prioritise activities as you go through and as such, you know, again, I think it's a continuous activity. You know, it, 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 I, mean, I think we all know shift left mm -hmm. and all this sort of thing, it's not something we leave to the end. Um, so. You know, in terms of budgeting, I you know I view it more as a as a continual spend on the way through, and maybe you do ramp it up a bit. You know, at the end, as you need, as your data comes through, and you need to test your your data migration, and there's a big big push there. But but still, you know, if you view it as a as a constant uh, you know, allocation of, of resources or something across the project, I, th I think it does become a lot easier to um, to, to fund or, or or plan for. Mm. Okay, so let, let's stay in the same ballpark and, and we'll go post-implementation. So how can organizations balance the need for continuous innovation and delivery with the need to reduce the total cost of ownership and mitigate project risks? Oh, test automation, test automation, test automation. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Look, I mean, um, that was my key learning from visiting a number of um, people who had been through this before we started. And that was you know, get your test automation sorted. There's a, um, a number of patches and updates that you have to do on a frequent basis. I was a cost centre owner. My boss had prickly pockets and wasn't looking <laughs> to spend any money and I'd done some really estimates that it was looking at around 300k a year just to deal with the updates and that was a bit unacceptable. So um, after having met with those um, other organisations, I went back and looked at our budget of a measly month and um, we we relitigated that and we ended up uh, 26 weeks uh, 12 uh, sprints and we um, automated our, we had 3600 test cases for the uh, program which we distilled down to into about 430 automated test cases um, and another 22 uh, integrated test cases by the systems we didn't have a lot of automated um, integration when we went live, we only had two integration points automated. Um, that would have taken eight weeks, four people, took six hours, one test engineer, and um, 
up to a week if you included maintenance and any additional re um, automation you needed to add. Now we had that ready within the context of our program and um, we were able to uh, release testers and though anyone who's been in testing just before go live, how many of you run around pulling together regression packs trying to test deploys and prove that they work? We've all been there and it's, it's a hive of activity and, and stress and uh, I think um, our guys, they were um, pushing their butter and they're coming back six hours later. Yep, looks good. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we were releasing people and providing feedback within a day. So then once we went live, we had that ab ability to do that as well. So definitely sounds like a wise investment. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I know this is helpful when it comes to planning. The cost of our test uh, effort in the program was around 17% of the overall program budget. And of that 17%, 11% was test automation. So um, we, we started payback before we went live and we expected to get payback within the first year. Andrew, anything to add on that? I think you've done a pretty good job of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think just to, just to add a little bit is that whole you know shift left. Um, yeah, by by finding defects early, you you, you actually minimise the cost of uh, for everything because you know you've you've it's likely to be quicker to fix because there's you know maybe you're not you're not live so you're not going to be outages and change windows and all that sort of thing. Um, so I, I do thoroughly believe in, in testing what you can as soon as possible and, and running that uh, in parallel. And, and if you're developing things too, you know, test-driven development where you, you're, you're writing your test cases, um, you know, bef before the developers even start, so they've got something to test against. Mm -hmm. And obviously they're building unit tests and, and all that into the, into the code as, as they go, so that when you do get to the end, you, you can run your automated testing and you, you know where you, you know where you're at. So again, it's all. It's, a, it's the cost of managing risk, I, I believe, as I said before. Mm. So reducing cost of ownership, automation, automation. Absolutely. Automation, yes. Well, thank you, Tony. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask a question? I'm really interested in the end user, the customer. I'm just wondering what has worked for you guys in the past, what approaches you've taken to really testing um, the experience of the end user. Um, learned this from you uh, and the work that you did on our D365 implementation. Uh, we, acceptance testing, user acceptance testing, we took a two-pronged approach, right? You, there's the functional testing, coming in and verifying that the job that they do today, they can do on the new system. But from a, um, a data perspective, you know, we're a bunch of contractors sometimes, or we're We've got outsourced partners supporting us doing our testing, but the business are the ones that really know their data and understand it. And so as a form of acceptance and, um, and as a part of the testing, we embed part of the business in our data migration testing and make them part of it. Help, help, they help us, right? So that by the time we end up in production, they're familiar with where it's come from, where it's gone to, what's maybe transformed with it, and um, yeah. Hopefully they've got a good understanding of what they're receiving. Well, I expect that they would. Yeah. Okay. Probably a slightly different tack is, and this relates to what I was talking about before in terms of the knowledge that's within the business. And, and the challenge that you know I was faced with is that we were trying to change the business process and the workflow at the same, at, as you know with the new systems bring in. So it's very hard to take existing users and say, okay, well, yeah, you know, what do you think of this new system? Because it's like, oh. The new system doesn't do all of these steps. You know, why, you know it's broken. Why, why doesn't it do that? So that's why we had to take the approach of pulling some sort of open-minded type users, you know, or, or more senior, advanced users or subject matter experts out of the business, kind of educating them and opening their mind in terms of, hey, these, this is the art of the possible. This is what a new, what new systems can do these days, and start to get them to think beyond the current processes, um, and you know, have them sort of on that journey so that they could. They could then uh, help us to, you know, streamline the, you know, or completely transform the workflow, and then they had the, you know, inauspicious job of then going back and selling that in to their, to their ex, you know, to their colleagues who are back in the team, and that's that's the big challenge because, um, you know, I'm thinking of one user in particular when we showed him this new system that we wanted to go to first, he said, oh, that will never work. 
he said, oh, that's never, oh, he said, that's never going to work. That's never going to work. And we got, and it's like, no, we've, we've got to make this work, you know, so, yeah. And it was, it was this journey in terms of, oh, okay. And, you know, slowly, slowly sort of converted him to then at the end, he was like, he was a raving fan. He was like, oh, no, this is great. And it sort of, it been, uh, I guess, enlightened in the, in the way of this new system. And it's interesting that he, he was very involved and was trusted by the users, so then he was involved in sort of selling it in and, and, and training all of the users how to use the new system. He's then gone on to now be a, a product manager in the business, so that he hasn't gone back to his old job. He's actually really enjoyed. Um, and it was actually, it, what was interesting was he saw the cultural difference between the, the technology part of the business versus the, um, so the operational part of the business. In the operational part of the business, they always expected there to be a, like a concrete answer that this is how we're going to do it or this is, this is how it's done. We're in, in the technology part of the business. We're, we're like, we don't know how. So it's like we're figuring it out or we're making it up or we're working it out and designing it as, as we go. Sure, we'll get to an answer at the end. Um, but it's, it's quite a different, different way of working. And I think that was the thing he struggled with at first when he was saying that will never work. He was coming from a, a point of view of very black and white, like as what I see today, that will never work. But he wasn't open to like, oh, that doesn't need to be the end result. We can configure it and transform it into something that will work and, and be even better for our team. So I think that's the problem with users is that they don't all, always, you know, this is, you know, you want to involve users, definitely. But I think you have to be, um, one, you have to make sure you're choosing the right users and mm. you have to be taking them on that journey to sort of open their mind into the art of the possible, particularly if you're wanting to completely transform the, the business process and, and automate things. Because at the end of the day, we were putting in a system that was going to result in the team that he'd come from being reduced you know, by a half or, or two thirds in size because suddenly there was all this automation, um, which is again a really difficult thing to deal with. So there's all those kind of people and cultural issues that you're dealing with as well on the, on the way through, which I think makes it really difficult. What's the balance between one, manual versus automation testing, two, business versus dedicated QA doing the testing, and who maintains automated testing post go live? Um, if you're talking in the terms of an ERP program, we, we wouldn't do it until it's um, stable code. Um, and th so, um, yeah, once the code was stable, we would look to do our automation. Um, but if you're talking in the context of BAU, um, it, it again, you know, you might take an auto automation first approach, particularly in the digital domain, um, but, which is another big conversation, so I'll, I'll park that for now. But um, business versus a dedicated QA doing the testing. Um, I don't, rightly or wrongly, I kind of think acceptance testing is a marketing activity. It's the first time that the business come in and see the uh, working system. You don't want them to have a bad experience. My recommendation is always to have uh, professional testers or de the dedicated QA team going in there and making sure that it, it works before you let the business at it. Otherwise, to Andrew's point, they go out and they tell everyone about how great it isn't and then uh, really makes it difficult to transition the change into the uh, BAU. So uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, business versus dedicated QA, dedicated QA first, followed by business, when we get an acceptable level of quality, right? And it's a carefully managed, and again, to your point, making sure that you've got the right type of person, inquisitive mind, understands that things are changing in that environment and that nothing's like production. Um, uh, and who maintains the automated testing post go live? Uh, in my experience, it's been testing, um, but then I've worked in larger companies that have got full testing practices that might not be the um, situation that you're in, and in which case it you would be choosing a tool that would work for the people that are, are using it, you know, coded versus codeless. So uh, again, that's context-based, in my opinion. Testing in parallel to development could be easy to implement in a new project, but in an ongoing project where testing is a catching up task, how can we correct things? So when you say testing is a catching up task, Put some context around that. That's sort of implying that there's kind of defects being reported and they need to be validated. And I, I guess is that how you interpret that yeah, question? Yeah, testing is a catch-up task. It's like do you develop and then test rather than test and develop in parallel. 
right? So we're talking um, waterfall versus sprint or agile, right? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I do see ongoing testing. It is a capability, and it's also a mindset in the business that you know, it's you know, quality is, is built in. You, do, you can't test in quality when you, you're testing at the end. All you're doing is finding defects. But if you if you have quality practices as you go through, then you you, you know you have a better chance of building it in. I I think that the catch up is I think is more like you, like we we're just saying about you know people reporting defects and that you have to validate those and then you have to fix them. So you end up with this back this backlog of defects. And again, I mean it just it's just a matter of prioritisation. I mean mm. I I just you know. The way we always have is yeah, you know, yeah. P1, P2, P3, whatever, yeah. whatever, and you're just working through them just as, as best you can. Okay. Do you see ongoing testing as a capability that needs to be built as part of business user roles, especially as organizations move to more agile, continuous delivery? Again, it's context based, right? I worked in telcos. You couldn't get the business to come in. There's quite, there's quite a lot of complexity, a massive amount of change whether it's in a network perspective or the um, or the uh, just in the IT area and then you've got the integration between the both you've got business that are very siloed they understand their bit and the other person understands their bit so I, I, th I think that in that situation you do need a capability to support testing and change right but um, if you're a smaller organization then I think there's a blending that can happen yeah or possibly a level of capability that needs to be embedded within yeah. the subject matter experts so that yep. they can contribute effectively to, yep. to, to the test effort. Yep. Okay, um, how do you balance focus between a happy path and edge cases? When yeah. edge cases may represent less than 1% of instances and similarly small revenue impact? I'll pick that one up because I, that was the point I raised earlier. Yeah, I, I find that edge cases, or not, or not happy path, can can be really dis disruptive because often what can happen is you, you know, if you go off the happy path and you end up in a manual process that something then needs to be handled manually. It's even though it might only happen, say one percent of the time, the the amount of effort that then goes into managing those those edge cases can be like you know fifty percent of the whole effort of the team or, or whatever. It's it's just really disruptive, really time consuming, um, especially when those edge cases, you know, because those edge cases can lead to you know, corrupt data, you know, manual processes, people not being billed properly. And so you end up in the situation where you may have to go back and unwind a ho some whole lot of transactions manually and then replay them through and all, all of this and that messiness can just take so much time. And that's, again, what I've personally experienced with projects I've been on when we haven't manage those edge cases properly and, and I, I think it, well, the question here is around that focus and I would I, I would say that you inherently end up having to put more focus on the edge cases because you know the happy part's pretty simple it's like this happens this happens this happens and yeah great we're through that's kind of what you do in the first week you know the, the, the other kind of you know, 51 weeks of the year is that hey when this odd thing happens here you know wh what do we do you know what what you know what? I was, the good example is, um, and I'm I'm stealing something from from my sister here. Um, she just started working for an organisation that is in healthcare, um, and they that she lives in the US, so they provide healthcare systems in the US. And and the 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 problem in the US is that you have people that don't have birth certificates, and and. You know, systems are built. You know, like a primary key. It's like you know, everyone has a birth certificate, everyone has an ID, and all that. You get people coming in to hospitals that, you know, either are undocumented migrants or they grow up in a, on a reservation. And so, when they were born, there was, you know, they were born on the reservation. They, there's no birth certificate. What What do you do? And so, you know, there was a scenario there where hospitals could, couldn't provide health care to people um, that suddenly turned up with some really bad medical condition because the, the IT system wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. You know, and, these, and it's kind of, you know, this is probably a bit of an extreme edge case, but it is actually real life. And, and so that you start to realise, you know, from my point of view, each, I think edge cases are often where the, where the real value is delivered because, it, you know, if you can handle them properly, you save a lot of time and then you can get much better performance out of your automation. 
Okay. Um, in terms of data migration, how important is it to ensure your existing data is cleaned and how much effort in resource and time is needed? Context base. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've, I've worked in some really um, difficult data migrations. Um, you try doing a network um, migration, so we had the physical and logical aspects of in inventory being migrated from a basically it was garbage in garbage out you could write whatever you liked and you and i don't know if you know much about networks telco networks you actually have to build the network from the inside out and um it didn't matter how much cleansing we did in that project and then we had to build it all manually and we stopped our migration so um yeah um yeah, just as needed, whatever, whatever you need. I, I'm certainly not for cleansing data more than you need to, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it will be needed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the project I'm working in at the moment, we've done a bit of a fair bit of data cleansing before we migrate, um, because we're migrating in tranches. We're doing some whilst we migrate and go back and do a sweep up of that um, data that we didn't migrate. Uh, it, yeah, it's what you need. So you gave the, the, the number on the test automation uh, being 10%. Uh, do you have a, a time, effort, effort resource? Uh, oh, you mean 11% of our budget? Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So it's, do you have something similar for data migration? No, no it's, it's different depending on the situation. In Andrew's view, having been a CIO, is his advice that business bends to platform rather than vice versa? Other CXOs might be very reluctant, especially CX UX related. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is the million dollar question really, which is how much is the business prepared to change? And you know, again, it depends. Uh, it, it depends, you know, how, you know, are you prepared for the cost of customization and what that entails? And I think if you're a large business, maybe like a telco or something like that, and you, you can, you know, realistically, you can afford the cost of having those teams there, able to support the customizations. Um, you know, but um, you know, I think you've just got to have the conversation up front when you're making. You know, go into it with your eyes open, consciously know what you're doing, because if the business expectation is that they're putting in a new system that's going to do everything, it's going to be really cost effective to operate. But you get to the end and you've done so much customization that you need to then maintain all these development teams and testers and everything, you really haven't achieved the business outcomes of, the, of that whole thing, you know, that whole transformation that you've done. And you've got to really ask, well, you know, almost like, why do we do it? Um, so, you know, I would just say go in, you know, have those discussions with your other, you know, your other execs at the start and, and be, you know, be hard. So look, some, when it, you know, often what I find when it comes to talking about dollars, and you're really pragmatic, you know, people are suddenly prepared to compromise. It's like, well, you know, we're going to need a team of five people to maintain it. This is going to cost us, you know, plus support, it's going to cost us a million dollars a year or something. People, people suddenly start to view these things quite differently. So, you know, I, th I think, and that's one thing we haven't probably covered enough here is the, is the, you know, the financial and budgetary side of things. And it, the classic comes back to test automation. It's, a, it's an investment up front, but you get a long-term return from it, where if you're doing testing manually, you, you're always having to do it. It's this, you know, it might be cheaper up front, but it's this constant grind and, you know, on, the, on the budget. So again, it's about making these decisions constantly rather than getting to the end of the project and thinking, oh, damn, we <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> yeah. Okay. In, in hindsight, what are the questions you wished you'd asked before choosing your system and or vendor? That's definitely you. Well, I, I think you've got to look, and I'm stealing an answer from you actually off the spreadsheet. Yeah. So you've got, to, you've got to look at who else is using the software and even go and see them, spend time with them. Go, you know, I think it's very painful when you're the first to implement a system in region or in country, an ERP system. Um, and you know that will drive a lot of cost if you if you were the you know if you're the first to be do it using a system in a particular way or the first in region and there's very little support around you. So you know again it sounds it sounds luxurious getting on a plane and flying to somewhere else that, that where someone's using the system, but you know it's it's well worthwhile. And you know I I 
always, you know, often when I'm later in a project, I always wish I'd spent more time in due diligence and found out where those real fish hooks were before I, you know, got in sort of neck deep in a, in a project and were having issues trying to go live. Can agile principles be applied? and to test earlier in ERP transformations and de-risk end phases that are closer to critical milestones like go live? Well, I think we did. I think we applied. Um, we certainly tested aspects of the delivery sooner. Um, we didn't wait till all of development was complete before we started our test activity, um, as I mentioned. But we planned, sorry, we planned to do that um, in some respects. Um, I think we had customizations and configurations. We did one first and then the next. And um, there's no reason why nobody else can't do that or anybody else can't do that. So yes, I, I would agree. Agile principles can be applied. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know, thinly slicing things yeah. and yeah, agile mindset. Um, yeah, you know, just think about agile. It you know, it's all around the the whole deming cycle, which is you know, you do something, you you know, PDCA, whatever it is, plan, do, check, act, which is you you take some action and then you, you look at how it went and you, you, you look at the result and then you improve and you know you, you're able to improve over time. So this this idea of constant improvement. I mean I remember some big projects I worked in Telco back in the nineties, showing my age here again. <laughs> where you know we had these massive big projects that you know it was called telecom at the time. Oh. And they went on for for years before anything was yeah. planned to be delivered and, and they were you know, they were so off, <laughs> off track it? before we even got anywhere near the delivery. There's a, there's a number, isn't there? It's like the business changes something like 18% every yeah. year. Yeah. So by the time you deliver a project two years later, you've already yeah. lost. So I think the discipline of, yeah. of having those smaller increments and being able to play back what you've done to your key mm. business stakeholders is so important to keep you on track, particularly if there's a business change. Yeah. Um, and look, even if you're implementing a big um, you know, monolith sort of ERP system, you think, oh, well, can't we just deliver that in but one big chunk? But there's work going through the whole way through, and you just have to view work differently in terms of it's not just delivering that big chunk. There's, it's all of those activities that combine to turn into that end result. Yeah. Okay, so can Tony clarify, does she mean 30% of the ERP implementation budget should be for testing, no. or does the contingency need to be 30% of the test budget? 30% well, would be horrendous, wouldn't it? You'd only want... Uh, well, Industry standard used to be about 24, 25, didn't it? Look, our budget was, we were 17% of budget and that included 30% um, contingency during test execution, plus some additional contingency for um, sudden and extras requirements or needs. So no. Okay, Andrew. Uh, who should be on the hook to write the <laughs> test cases if this is done ahead or in parallel with development? Yeah, good question. Yeah, you know, I think there's a certain mindset and discipline, um, and you know, for you know, in testing and to be a good tester. And it's it's really I always find it really interesting when I'm interviewing a tester or a test you know, test manager, and they they start asking me pedantic questions about you know um, the contract and, <laughs> and things like you know when they can take leave and what hours they are. You know, cause that's what you want from a tester. You want them to be you know going through every line of the contract and and asking you all the tricky questions. And that's a mindset that's not you know not everyone has that mindset. And often you know developers, it's classic developers, a bit more. You know, gung ho. They're wanting to build things. They're not necessarily wanting to check things. And you know, managers. Uh, I don't know. Think a big picture or something. I, I, don't, I don't know. But it's there's a specific mindset that with a set of disciplines and practices and structured, you know, structured approach that goes around testing. And I, I think it's it's not necessarily. You know, I don't think it's the person that you need. You need that mindset within the team and then those disciplines and those approach. And and I think you need it right at the start. You know, because if you know, it's it's if you don't have that mindset, it's difficult to write a consistent set of, uh, a well-constructed set of test cases that would then test the system. And then, you know, you may not even then think to put together a defect register and prioritise and everything that goes with that. So think of testing, you know, as a practice, a discipline and a mindset, not just a, a single act of, I, you know, I bring up a screen and I push a button and I expect X to happen. That's kind of right at the end of a whole lot of other things. But if you don't, have the, the mindset and the approach, then that pushing the button and something happening on the screen, I mean, that's almost ir irrelevant, isn't mm, it? Yes. So, so I would say, you know, absolutely. 
Can Tony define what she means by defect rate and what is a good benchmark? Oh, um, so defect um, rate, usually we talk about the number of defects per 100 test cases, so 30 defects to 100 test cases would be 30%. Um, depends on the project, if it's um, out of the box, no integration, you'd hope for five, <laughs> five to ten. If you, large amounts of integration, um, certainly 30% is good. I've worked in projects where the defect rate's been 50%, it's been e and even higher, um, yeah. For an ERP transformation similar to the one that you uh, undertook at two degrees, what was your benchmark? Um, I won't talk about benchmark and tell you what it was. Um, in a uh, system test it was 20%, it was okay. Um, in uh, SIT it was 40%, a bit higher than you'd want. And performance test, security test and all those profile type testing it was 21%. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't too bad. I, I think 3,600 test cases, just over 1,000 defects. When in the journey do you involve business users? Some of the examples where issues have been identified sound like it was too late. Was it waterfall? So are we talking the test journey or the program journey? Because the program it should be up front, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I was describing before is we took people, SMEs out of the business, mm. uh, right at the start and, and involved them as, as really you know, our, our business users that we eventually turned into product <laughs> managers and, and various other roles. Um, and they were then that conduit back into other business users and all that. So again, I think, yeah, you know, right up front, because I mean, you, you've got to be gathering requirements right up front, and then going through you, you know vendor selection and all that. You're going to need the business, you know, right from those point. And it's good to then be building people who have that knowledge and skill that you can then, you know, they can be on board right through the project as you as you come out the other end. So it's from. Yeah, day one. And from a testing perspective, the same, you want to know what their acceptance criteria is so that you can check that when you're doing your testing that there's no gaps between they, what they want to check and um, what you're already testing, otherwise there could be some unpleasant surprises. I think you also alluded to it earlier when you spoke about the acceptance testing being the marketing uh, bit for, yeah. the, for the business yeah, exactly. as well. Yeah. Okay, thin slices can only be achieved if the foundation is there. How do you balance getting foundation in and convincing stakeholders about vertical slicing with BC? And this is the challenge, isn't it? And depending on you know, how you can slice things up. Um, well, look, there is a lot of context there, but you, your point is really that if, if you don't have the right foundation in place, um, then, then it's, it's hard to then start to deliver. And, and often, yeah, we talk about microservices and all, you know, all of that, but often if you're working with a big monolith system, you know, and maybe the integration with it is really limited, you, you can't. And you know, I agree, you just sort of have to work with what you've got, really. And, and, and I think, again, if you've got that mindset of wanting to move towards a more agile approach, then, then it is a journey that you just have to take the steps that you can as you go to get more agile as you progress, but maybe you can't. Yeah, you can't start by slicing things, and that's what that's kind of why I talk about tra transition stages. Because I mean, we you know where I've been is that we had to keep that big old kind of system running right till we turned it to, until we migrated the very last thing off it. But we were starting to replace parts of the functionality in the old system with new systems as we as we turned on. But then you know having data being sort of migrated across in real time through this integration platform, and. Um, you know, in the end, we would end up in a, a much better agile position, but there was always this, this pain of being some parts being able to be agile and new, pl new platforms, some parts still being on old platforms, and just navigating through that, those transitional states. Um, yeah, obviously much better if you can go with a big, big bang. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next one, penultimate question uh, for now. <laughs> Do you have any examples of where there was a challenging stakeholder that was not engaged in the ERP transition and how that was overcome? Yeah. I, mean, I think with stakeholders is that often stakeholders kind of just want it to work. They, they, they just yeah. want to get on with their business because if they have systems that are not performing properly or performant, it's going to make it hard for them to hit their targets. And, you know, the, 
the challenge is is when you're you're causing problems with those other stakeholders because the system's not working right or whatever and they're not going to hit their targets which is going to cause them problems it is a really difficult conversation but you know i think you've got to just try and you know <laughs> work be with as, them. yeah work with them be as open and transparent as you can and having that discussion because i mean we don't you know unfortunately it's not a perfect world there you know with technology you are going to hit issues on, yeah. on the way through um, so I guess it's also about understanding what the problems are and trying to overcome yeah. them right? yeah. open the lines of communication the usual <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one of the challenges is you know, often when you're going live on a big project like this is that there might be a defect that you have to put a manual work around mm -hmm. in place for go live and that is using resources or people in their team to run that manual workaround while you're busily trying to fix it and that that's kind of like this friction or this drain on their team and that can be again a really hard discussion and often going you know, to be in a discussion which is yeah how long am I going to have to run this manual workaround before you can deliver me the system that actually remo removes that and enables us to run more efficiently and almost negotiate you know the business wanting you know, technology to pay for those those people that are running that manual workaround, um, but you know, often as a case is that technology, you, you don't have the people budgets to, to um, resource another part of the business and provide resources for that workaround. So it's kind of a lose-lose, there's, there's no other way um, to, to do it, that, that business unit needs to, to, to be on board and do it themselves. Uh, again, you know, difficult conversation to have. Okay, last slide of question. How are ERP transformations being done today? Agile versus waterfall? My experience mainly um, waterfall. Mm. Yeah, I, what I what I find is that it's um, often you end up in a situation where, from a from a team point of view, they're working in some sort of agile methodology mm -hmm. within a team, mm -hmm. but then from a more of a program management around the outside or portfolio management, you you have a much more of a, a waterfall approach where you're thinking about the total scope of the program and the budgets and the you know, and the timelines of that. But you've got this this agile delivery mechanisms which are fine grained inside. An interesting insight on that is that it's very hard even to go out and recruit young gen, what are we recruiting, gen Y, gen Z, whatever, whatever it is, that, that want to work in a waterfall model. They're all, they all just want to work in Agile. That's all they know. Often that's all they've worked in. And if you kind of go to them, well, yeah, we don't, we don't do that Agile stuff around here. You know, we're gonna, you've got to come and you've got to work. They're, just, they're not even going to sign up. They're going to be out. They're just going to be like, no, nah, you guys are like, so 1985, whatever. You know, we, we, um, we, we don't want to work here. And that's, so I think as, as leaders, you know, we have to think about that. If we want an, a, if we want an engaged you know, workforce that, are, that are, are youthful with lots of energy who can work on our projects, you know, we have to... You know, we have to think about how we can empower them and engage them within that sort of agile methodology because that's what they want and that's, you know, they want to work remote and they want to, you know, have their scrums and their stand-ups and all that fun stuff. Ceremonies. Ceremonies, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, you know, which is... Which is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it like old cynics, yeah. yeah. But, no, but <laughs> seriously, I mean, no, we make fun of it. But, but it is true from an organisation point of view, I, I think, and look, I grew up, you know, I sort of worked in Waterfall, projects way back when but it's not what your workforce expects any, anymore I think so you've got to be pragmatic in, in terms of you know how do you how do you get the best of people how do you empower them and I think a lot of that is through those those scrum teams yeah. but you perhaps some guardrails around the outside to make sure you actually get done what you're supposed to get done. Mm. I think that question took us back to the beginning with your decades of experience. Oh thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Last question, just to wrap up, a quick fire question. Um, if you have one piece of advice to give people embarking on digital transformation, what would that be? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> you want to do what? <laughs> oh, me, I'll always ask questions. Make sure you ask questions. You're not the only one who's ever going to do what you want to do. Go and talk to other people who've done it. Get their learnings. Snag bag tag them and call them your own and make it work better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely agree. Going, going, as I said, get, you know, whether it's you know, in the local industry here in New Zealand, getting around and talking to people who might have done it before, um, who have experience is good. It's that, it's that context and that perspective that you really need. Um, just kind of knowing, knowing where, the, where the issues may lie and how to approach it. I think there's a, 
the more you can learn up the front, the more the more that you can then set expect expectations and manage those expectations with your shareholders, because a stakeholder, sorry, because it's that it's that stakeholder relationship which is the is the most important thing as you go through, and the more informed you are, the easier that will be. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tony. Thank, uh, thank you. you all. They were great, great questions that came through.